Hello and welcome to this seventh event in the Christian Literary Imagination series. And uh, this is a series which is sponsored by uh, Blackfriars Hall, Las Casas Institute and the University of Oxford and by Georgetown, Georgetown University. And today we have Claire Asquith, uh, who's going to be speaking about Michael Drayton's early poems uh, in Consolation for Catholics. We have about 50, I think just a little over 50, uh, registered for, today, for today's event. Michael Drayton, an interesting, uh, interesting poet, uh, profuse in the, in, in the amount that he wrote, both in poetry and in, and in drama. He was born in 1563. I suppose he's best known for this anecdote that, uh, that, that's come down to us, that it was with Ben Johnson that he uh, had a final drinking bout with William Shakespeare in April 1616, after which Shakespeare died, a few days after which I think it was. However, it's an anecdote and I don't think it's ever been proved to be true, but it's a lovely little, a lovely little story. He died in 1631 and was buried in Westminster Abbey. He had survived as a poet and a dramatist through the turbulence of uh, Elizabeth I, then on with James I, and then the first few years of Charles I. Uh, something which, which actually wasn't easy to do. Uh, as a poet and as, as a dramatist. Anyway, when he died, 1631, it was decided to bury him in Westminster Abbey, which in itself demonstrates, I think, that um, he had the blessings of the establishment, at least at that time. Whether he was buried horizontally or like Ben Johnson, vertically, uh, I don't know. And I asked Claire a little while ago whether she knew, and she doesn't know either. But sometimes they buried them vertically in order to save space. What we want to find out today with, uh, with, with Drayton is what was the nature of his uh, literary, Christian literary imagination. And within that, that context, I think Claire's going to, going to propose that these early poems had a great Catholic, Catholic element hidden beneath them at a time of great political difficulties and great, great danger. Claire Asquith uh, is uh, an independent critic. She got a first class honours degree in English at St Anne's College in, in Oxford. Uh, she, she went on to uh, tour in, uh, in, in the Eastern Europe because her husband is a, is a diplomat. Uh, and out in Eastern Europe, she started to understand things about hidden codes, hidden messages uh, with, within, the, within, the lang within the language. She, uh, she then wrote her book, uh, Shadow Play, highly controversial, but so refreshing, talking about the hidden, hidden codes that may be there within Shakespeare. That was came out in 2015, and then she went on to write uh, a book on Shakespeare's narrative poems. Uh, they were published, that was published in 2018. And again, to place the poems within the context of the Catholic struggle within the, within the uh, Elizabethan reign. So we're looking forward to hearing what uh, she's going to say to us today about Michael Drayton. So over to you, Claire. Thank you for coming to listen to a lecture on such a very obscure poet. Wrongfully obscure, I think. Michael Drayton is a contradictory figure. Barely read today, he is yet the author of the most perfect sonnet in the English language, since there's no help, come let us kiss and part. In many of his works, he seems a bit of a pedant, a bit of a dusty antiquary, and yet he collaborated with a raffish bunch of dramatists on numerous plays now lost. He wrote Polly Albion, one of the longest and least readable poems in the language, and he wrote Piers Gaveston, one of the raciest. 
He had Catholic friends and patrons, but Puritan ones too. He was clearly well liked by his many associates, um, yet their praise, though not damning, was faint. Very temperate in his life, slow of speech, inoffensive in company. He was a pious poet, virtuous, honest, well-governed, which is almost miraculous among good wits in these declining and corrupt times, wrote Francis Mears. You know, to modern ears, he sounds a bit of a prig. He complains regularly about the scandalous neglect of virtuous and honest poets like him, and his official portrait has a distinct and disapproving frown. Now, I want to put two of his early works under the microscope in this talk, partly to show that Drayton was not at all the dull dog he seems, but mainly as evidence that good wits like him were in fact exercising great ingenuity in a challenging enterprise. And that was getting works into print that could be viewed in two ways, almost like holograms. The surface level eased the text past the censor and the inner level had a meaning intended for a, a particular reading community. Now, until recently, this course, this way of publishing, uh, was thought to be impossibly risky. How could, how could people do it? And one knows about the people who are actually caught out. Uh, Johnson was one. But from the early 1590s, as oppositional voices began to occupy the broad centre of English politics, you can sense the machinery of licensing, publishing, and censorship beginning to creak under the strain of keeping down this, this tide of dissent. Anthony Monday, for instance, has always been seen as a writer of government propaganda. But Donna Hamilton, controversially, has painted his underlying religious sympathies and indeed his literary mission, as she would call it, as Catholic. She has him down as a skillful equiv equivocator and casuist, a master of rhetorical indirection. By posing as virulently anti-Catholic and bracketing his works with passages violently hostile to Rome, Monday managed to smuggle into print much of the English Catholic narrative that would otherwise have been lost. Now, I'm going to argue that Drayton started his literary career by deploying a very similar method and that his inexperience made his intentions dangerously and for us usefully transparent. And it's not hard to see where and when he first learned his trade. Son of a Warwickshire tanner, Drayton was taken on possibly tenant spotted at an early age by the local landowner, Sir Henry Goodyear who sponsored his education and absorbed him into the Goodyear household as page, family servant, um, advisor, and friend. And his daughter, Anne, became Drayton's lifelong muse and the Goodyear family seat, a former nunnery on the banks of the River Anchor, became his lifelong image of an earthly paradise. Sir Henry Goodyear, however, was on the government blacklist and his estates and fortunes had suffered heavily at the hands of the government right up to his death, as his family later testified. Uh, partly through his wild brothers-in-law, the Lowthers, he became deeply enmeshed in the scheming around the cause of Mary, Queen of Scots. Uh, Goodyear was one of the first people to welcome her across the border when she came into England, and he supplied her within the first week with a cipher for her to use in her correspondence. When his part in all this emerged in 1572, Goodyear was clapped into the tower, left there for a year, and he was probably only freed because he was close, closely related to the Cecil and Bacon family. In fact, his guardian was uh, uh, Nicholas Bacon, who was attorney of the Court of Wards, and I think some of his financial troubles may have started with that. After that, he became a loyal soldier fighting with distinction under Leicester, and gradually regained his status as JP, MP, Sheriff of Warwickshire, all very expensive, um, but compromised figures like him, and one can think of the Earl of Oxford and uh, the Earl of Southampton, were sitting ducks, easy pickings for the predatory new men running the country. So in 1591, 
four years before the unhappy and impoverished Sir Henry's death at 61, his 28 year old protege published his first work. It was called The Harmony of the Church, a translation of biblical passages so unremarkable for the time that it is often passed over altogether by Drayton critics and biographers. Um, it's a selection of the many songs of lament, triumph, supplication and praise that intersperse the Old Testament. The poetry is work a day on the whole, but what is interesting is the choice of texts. Almost all relate to the Israelite captivity. And the very same passages crop up, crop up repeatedly in the work of Catholic composers like Byrd and Tallis, Catholic exiles like Allen and Parsons, and Catholic missionaries like Garnet and Southall. They provide haunting, resonant, and denial, deniable expression for the English Catholic predicament. Interesting, until recently, uh, Bird scholars, William Bird scholars like Joseph Kerman, resisted the idea violently that uh, Bird was in any sense using Catholic code. But following research into the writings of Catholic exiles, research that should really be done more by English literature scholars, I think, um, Kerman very publicly changed his mind. Musicologists now accept that a covert discourse was carried on between Bird, his listeners, and his colleagues abroad through his choice and treatment of Old Testament texts and lyrics. Now Drayton's first extract, A Song of Moses from Deuteronomy 32, could almost be a rebel song for Catholic, English Catholics. It is a satisfyingly thorough account of God's punishment of the blasphemers who persecute the Israelites and desecrate their sacred places. If they're patient in adversity, prophesies Moses, God will grind their oppressors conclusively and finally and utterly into the dust. Now, Deuteronomy 32 evidently kept English hearts up. It's quoted by Robert Southall in one of his surviving letters to Aquaviva from England. Similar extracts follow, spreading out into other aspects of the Catholic captivity. Jonah, exiled and entangled in weeds in the belly of the whale. Anna, trusting that the Lord will protect the weak. A hope of rescue from Habakkuk, quoted by Robert Persons and used in Bird's motet, Aperabit in Finem. They include a classic text from Lamentations, again set to music by Talis and Bird. Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. There's even a brief flash of activism. Deborah leads the Israelites against their enemy and praises the heroine Jael, who killed their oppressor Sisera and nailed his head to the floor. You will remember this is the subject of uh, many, many Baroque paintings, Renaissance paintings. And this section ends with a plea from Isaiah, Isaiah 36. My soul has longed for thee by night. We have waited long for thee, O Lord. Throughout the whole book, there's a focus on passages about desecration, sacrilege, blasphemy, the destructions of temples, altars, and tabernacles, all always capitalized. And I'd be interested to know if anyone in the audience knew more than me, and whether this is uh, something that was more a subject for Catholics in England than abroad, the subject of iconoclasm. Doesn't seem to be in the work of exiles that I've read, not that much. Now these extracts are not printed in biblical order. Like Southern's poems, the series is orchestrated to form an emotional arc, moving from Moses' vision of present suffering and ultimate rescue, through a hymn to the beauty of the true church, the Song of Songs, Drayton puts the whole Song of Songs in, to songs of contrition, suffering, near despair, and back to patience. But the second half of the book is where the real dynamite is buried. Alarm bells should have rung with the censors at the title. These are songs out of the books of the Apocrypha, books accepted as canonical by Catholics, of course, but not Protestants. And they appear to advocate a great deal more than mere patience. This section highlights again the theme of destruction and sacrilege and begins with the two songs of Judith, the murderer of the tyrant Holofernes who forbade the Jews to practice their religion. 
In the first song, Judith begs God to help her to kill Holofernes. The second is a song of praise after the assassination. It is the standard biblical precedence for the violent removal of monarchs who vow thy temple to defile, which thou hast consecrated, yea, to pollute thy tabernacle, thy house and holy place. Now, this was skating on thin ice. The printer, William Carter, had been tortured and executed in 1584 for printing Gregory Martin's treatment of the Judith story, allegedly justifying the assassination of Elizabeth I. Following this, there are two extracts from the book of Esther, who though less violently than Jael and Judith, defended religious freedom bravely against tyranny and persecution. The book concludes with the prayer of Tobias, expressing the classical Southwellian advice of endurance and hope. I will confess thee in captivity and help to build thy tabernacle new, though scattered now, yet shall you gathered be. Towards the end, there's a prayer of the author, is what Drayton calls it, a moving piece of translation from Ecclesiasticus, I think the best in the book, begging the Lord to assist a man living among a hostile and godless people to somehow retain his spiritual integrity. Now, I would suggest that this book is an undertaking clearly designed to offer encouragement and consolation to the amorphous, camouflaged Catholic underworld to which the Goodyears and most of the Midland and Northern gentry and nobility belonged. How did Drayton get away with this? Well, he began by using the same device as Anthony Monday. The dedication title page and first few texts are so Puritan in tone that the leading Drayton scholar, Catherine Tillotson, is rather taken aback. He translates thy people and thy children as thy chosen and the elect. She identifies in some of these flagrant falsifications, a Calvinist tendency not evident in the rest of Drayton's work. Now, this is very clever of Drayton. To anyone querying the orthodoxy of the book, he can point to the years spent by the Protestants in the wilderness under Catholic Queen Mary, when they used, of course, exactly the same texts. It will not be the first time he adopts a Puritan persona to smuggle through Catholic themes. The second venture I want to look at, however, was bolder, so bold that he was forced to revise it a couple of years later, again in a reformist direction. In 1594, he stepped into the conspicuous literary arena of versified complaints, adding his contributions to the popular genre of soliloquies by the ghosts of famous historical figures, made popular by the poetic anthology, The Mirror for Magistrates. Thomas Churchyard's complaint of Shaw's wife, Samuel Daniel's complaint of Rosamond, and Shakespeare's Lucrece were the most recent in a series which recounted the rape by tyrannical monarchs of virtuous church-like women, often described in the idiom of the Song of Songs. I have argued that they were part of a public debate, not about the relative morality of fallen women from the past, but about the nature of the English church, about the legitimacy and impact of King Henry VIII's act of supremacy and its successor, the Elizabethan settlement, and about the pressing acute moral quandary of English Catholics. I'm gonna change that, English Christianity, because the debate addressed reformers equally almost more than Catholics. Now I'm going to propose that the tale of Matilda Fitzwalter was Drayton's new and original contribution to this particular debate. Unlike all her predecessors, Rosamond and so on, whom she calls looser wantons, she manages to resist her assailant, King John. She refuses to become his mistress and she flees to a convent in Dunmo where the historic Matilda was buried. And there, according to legend, the king poisoned her and she died. Drayton uses this tale as cover for the seizure of the church by the state under Henry VIII, a theme he was to return to openly a decade later in his Legend of Thomas Cromwell. And it's clear from writers of all denominations at this period that anguish at the cultural impact of Henry VIII's destructive act was widespread. Um, Camden denounced it 
even Robert Cecil was critical of it. It's interesting that actually, I would say Protestants and reformers were more indignant at the privatization of church land and church property than Catholics. This was the estate which the new church had hoped to inherit and it had fallen into the hands of avaricious new men instead of the new church. So there was a lot of public indignation about this. And in this despairing vein, the complaints of Daniel Churchyard, Spencer, Lodge and others lament the fatal compromise of the English church at the hands of the Tudor state as a fait accompli, a done deal. It's a tragedy, nothing can be done about it. But Drayton, like Shakespeare in The Rape of Lucrece, and Shakespeare is far more profound and subtle, Drayton has a different view. His Matilda embodies not the enforced middle way of the Elizabethan state church, nor the guiltily perjured subterfuge of church papists, Catholics who took protective coloring and went to the official church, but the high rise Catholic choice of open resistance, incurring exile, imprisonment or martyrdom. This courageous or obstinate minority maintained openly that the English church was indissoluble from the universal church of Rome. And it is these people that Drayton's poem celebrates. Far more fully than her predecessors, Drayton's heroine displays many of the attributes of the Bride of Christ or Ecclesia in the Song of Songs. The book you remember he'd already reproduced in full at the beginning of Harmony of the Church. Her every feature had been allegorized for centuries by patristic commentators. And she was a particular focus for writers now in the 16th century when the nature of the true church was the subject of such heated debate because she, everyone accepted, represented the true church ecclesia. Drayton's Matilda embodies the beauty of holiness but also the Catholic image of the magisterium. Drayton stresses her authority. The eyes of Solomon's bride were interpreted by the commentators as the leading lights, the authority of the church. Matilda's eyes are given great emphasis. They can kill and cure, hurt and heal, impart heavenly things to earth, control love's wanton riot, light the world to heaven. And she embodies truth. Her brows are tables, that is notebooks, pages of virtue with commentaries in the margins. She is a book of heaven's wonders, a siren to the soul, a perspective of heaven, all soothsayers divine by her, a lighthouse to wanderers. And then there is her chastity. The commentaries interpret the bride's lips as an allegory of restraint. And at Matilda's lips, according to Drayton, Abstinence keeps virtue in a diet, and wisdom grown wealthy liveth there at quiet. Wealthy, wisdom, chastity. Here is a little icon of the monastic life, richly endowed and yet wise. There's an emphatic interplay of red and white in her cheeks, an echo of Shakespeare's, in particular Shakespeare's Lucrece, and it identifies her with the heraldry of England as well as Ecclesia. So here is the idealized Catholic idea of the English pre-Reformation church. At first Drayton's king, King John, is Matilda's reverent follower, then her abject admirer, and then he morphs into lust. In a neat passage, he promises or threatens to combine her device, her empresa, with his, just as the Tudor state uh, combined the Tudor device, lion and the unicorn, um, with the churches, the whitewashed churches. Matilda's father, source of sacred counsel, warns her that she's under threat, that heaven's rich storehouse lies open. King John has all the attributes of Henry VIII. He's spoilt in youth, he's become a lustful tyrant, he's profaned the rights of wedlock, he's killed innocents. Matilda's father and her followers are imprisoned and banished their reputed traitors to the crown. In exile, her father laments the loss of his birthright, a rich isle once garner of my store. A very interesting little detail that he thinks of England as the garner of his store, a kind of 
clerical, ecclesial, ecclesi ecclesiastical way of looking at the country. And the tyrant burns the strongholds, the strongholds of, uh, of um, Matilda's party, like Nero warming his tyranny at their bright beacons. And her father gives up Matilda for lost. Now in 1592, two years before this poem, the most stringent laws so far against those who sheltered priests had been rigorously rolled out and Goodyear as magistrate was tasked with implementing them. Religious dissidents of Drayton's generation as well as his grandfather's would have recognized Matilda's plight as she is hounded through the country. My steps are told, my paths by spies are noted, my words are weighed, and at my thoughts ill meaning still doth catch. Into my counsels treason draws the latch, and at my gates suspicion still doth ward, sorrow my handmaid, falsehood on my guard. When Matilda takes refuge in a monastery, John sends his messenger to persuade her to submit. And from here on, Drayton departs from the Chronicles to give an unmistakable portrait of Tudor religious enforcement, in particular Thomas Cromwell, at work on the dissolution of the monasteries. A really dramatic debate happens on the doorstep of this abbey. The messenger is another Dagon. And as some of you will know, Dagon was the god to whom the Philistines offered the Ark of the Covenant, which they had stolen from the captive Israelites, a very good fit for the story of the dissolution of the monasteries. He arrives with a black commission from the king in the form of letters to execute his bloody act. He begins with courtly persuasion, attempting to induce the nun to sign the papers. Lo, here is pen and ink. Here, make the prince assurance of thy love. You see how bureaucratic this has become, how close to the process of the dissolution and very far away from a lover, a, a lustful lover trying to get hold of a, of, a, of a mistress. He explains that she has been deluded into resisting the king by foolish superstition derived from old folk by tradition. Her scruples are trivial toys of reputation whose ceremonies have the world infected. Reason roots out what error erst has sown, he explains. Chastity is one of those outdated ideas the wiser have neglected. Matilda fights back. Kings are God's vice guarants and should act accordingly. And as you will know, Cromwell's title was vice guarant in spirituals, that is chief executive of Henry's church. His mood darkens, minion quoth he, tis now no time to prate, dispatch or else I'll drench you presently. Of this nor that I stand not to debate, expects thou love where thou rewardst with hate. And it's a little rather humorous and dramatic exchange. You see Drayton might well have been a good dramatist and it's a pity that uh, his plays, plays have been lost. Now this invention of enforced suicide um, is acute. Drayton um, makes the messenger offer the poison to Matilda, it's a complete invention, so that she commits suicide. In other accounts, he poisons her directly. Now this enforced suicide is very clever because it picks up the establishment line that condemned English Catholics voluntarily chose, chose death for their own deluded reasons. They were pseudo martyrs. Matilda denounces the tyrant. She says, now he's got what he wants. Again, not really true to the love story. He hasn't got what he wants, he's lost it, but very true to the dissolution. He's got what he wants, but then she suddenly changes as, as Catholic martyrs did on the scaffold. She thanks him because she's given the, uh, her the opportunity for a martyr's death. She prays for his conversion in the classic speech of the Tudor Catholic martyr on the scaffold. And here, particularly in the doctrine that martyrdom sanctifies the life of the martyr, there are a series of deliberate echoes of the works of Robert Southall. Southall had been recently arrested and was awaiting execution in the Tower of London. And most marked is the echo of Southall's lines on the death of Mary, Queen of Scots. The bud was opened to let out the rose, wrote Southall, the chains unloosed to let the captive go. Now Drayton captures the same sense of tender release at um, Matilda's death. My soul thus from her prison set at large and gently freed from this polluted room. 
News of her death spreads abroad like wildfire, reaching her father in France who asks God the agonized question so often asked by Drayton's countrymen. If so, for virtue, these rewards be due, who shall adore or who shall honor you? Is this how you treat your friends? His instant reaction as he sees the blood of innocence staining the glory of fair Albion is to wreak revenge. But in the end, he restrains himself. Revenge is God, he re God's, he reflects. We must await heaven. And again, here we have the advice of Robert Southern, repeated in so many of Southern's poems, to take the path not of Judith, but of Esther, that of peaceful but unflinching resistance. In 1595, Sir Henry Goodyear died, the man of whom Drayton wrote, whose I was while he was. Goodyear bequeathed Drayton's muse to the 14-year-old Lucy Harrington, daughter of his friend, Sir John Harrington of Exton, a man whose profile looks very much uh, the same as the Catholic Sir Henry's. It was accordingly to Lucy that Drayton initially dedicated his poem, Matilda, in 1594. Shortly afterwards, however, she married Edward Russell, third Earl of Bedford, uniting the Harrington fortune to one of the grandest Puritan families in the country. Now, the impact on Drayton was almost instant and fascinating, confirming exactly how papist the mess passages we've looked at must have seemed at the time. A year later, he brought out a revised version of Matilda. This time, every scrap of Catholic reference is painstakingly written out or altered. The account now sticks closely to the histories and the chronicles. There are no attributes from the Song of Songs, no dissolution, no echoes of the dissolution, no dramatic coercion to take the poison, no hint of martyrdom, no echoes of Robert Southern, no real voice for Matilda's father. But it's still clearly a story of an assault by the monarch on the church. Matilda is still a paragon, but plainer, more demure, embodying the mean between precise and vain, very much in line with Rosamond and Shaw's wife, who, who represented not the Roman, but the English church. An interesting alteration to the uh, previous Matilda is the deal the lustful king presses on her. Still, he appropriates the spiritual to the temporal, but in less numinous terms. He wants her temples honored with my crown. You can see how Drayton is growing in skill because you put a crown on, on a queen's temples, but also the temples, the churches of the country, Elizabeth's country, were honored with, of course, the, the image of the, of the Tudor crown. And she will now be the rectress of this isle. Drayton invented this word rectress, not rector, but rectoress, and it very effectively evokes the horror felt by reformers at the incongruity of female spiritual authority. So in the story, we're back to the extinction of the reformers' ideal, first in the reign of Edward VI, then under Elizabeth, lamented by Churchyard and Baldwin in the Mirror of Magistrates. The Russells would have been delighted. So was Drayton simply a pen for hire, willing to be a voice piece for anyone who would pay him, no matter what their religious or political standpoint? He was certainly very much in need of money and patronage all through his life. Now, I would argue not. Scholars are puzzled by Drayton's break with the wealthy and open-handed Lucy Russell around the year 1600. They cite a clash of temperament. Lucy, high-spirited, witty, and wild, became a patron of the more maverick Dunn and Johnson. But the clash of religious allegiance may have mattered more. Both Johnson and Dunn were either Protestants or becoming Protestants when Lucy adopted them. But Drayton clearly could not continue the reformist line that he had begun. And a year after his Puritan Matilda, in 1597, he brought out a collection of what were to be his most popular works, uh, heroical epistles, many of them dedicated individually to Catholics. The one to Lord Manteagle, uh, the Catholic Lord, you remember, who was warned about the gunpowder plot um, a few years later, uh, was a, lav a lascivious 
sacrilegious letter from King John to a re-Catholicized Matilda. And this time, coarse blasphemy and physical and financial lust are spectacularly conflated as the monarch imagines appropriating Matilda's body exactly as the state appropriated the church. The sacred catalogue from the Song of Songs is now shockingly inverted. Matilda's breast he drools will be his altar. His, her lips will be his sacring bell. Wert thou the cross to thee who would not creep and wish the cross still in his arms would keep. Drayton adds an end note assuring us that this was an authentically historical portrait of the sacrilegious King John's attitude to the ceremonies of those times. He is clearly learning fast. Now, I find these unsteady early works of Michael Drayton fascinating. First, they shed new light on the many ways of dodging censorship open to determined writers and patrons in the 1590s. And secondly, they suggest that to be a pious poet was not necessarily to be a dull poet. Cunning, slippery, witty, ingenious are words closer to the mark. For writers who were not first rate, as Shakespeare was first rate, there, were definitely, there was definitely an artistic cost to playing this game. But there were gains. It looked as if Drayton managed to survive into his 60s as a professional writer and a man of integrity, thanks to his still unrecognized mastery of what a later writer called the juggling feat of two edged words. Now I want to end, if there's time, Michael, um, with Drayton's last poem. I realize you don't have an idea from that of the way he wrote. He wrote better and better and he has a a fine and dignified utterance, which is, reminds me of Dryden, actually. Um, this is his last poem. What's interesting about it, he wrote it the day before he died, is that it's dedicated as so many poems were all through his life to idea. An idea is synonymous with Anne Goodyear. But Anne, by this time, was an elderly matron. Why does he go on and on dedicating things to her? And, uh, I'm convinced that she, like many other women of the time, allowed their name to be put forward and to be a cover for, yes, the earthly love, but also the divine, the spiritual love that the poet or the patron was trying to get into print, trying to write about. And in this case, Idea, The River Anchor and Polesworth all are for Drayton, an image of the Catholic way to God of the church, the Catholic church of God, of, of the divine as he saw it. Now in this poem, um, he still uses uh, the little signals that all the poets did at the, then from the Song of Songs, eyes for teachers, hands were stewards in the Song of Songs. Uh, the commentators said stewards, operators, priests. Um, he looks back here to spiritual, to his life and mission. And it seems to be that as an unlikely instrument, he still managed to put across the spiritual message of Christianity. See if you get this as I read this very simple poem. And it's billed by his biographer as a poem, his last poem to Anne Goodyear. But I think it is a poem to God, the last thing this very pious man wrote before he died. So well I love thee, as without thee I love nothing. If I might choose, I'd rather die than be one day debarred thy company. Since beasts and plants do grow and live and move, beasts are those men that such a life approve. He only lives that deadly is in love. The corn that in the ground is sown first dies, and of one seed do many ears arise. Love, this world's corn, by dying multiplies. The seeds of love first by thy eyes were thrown into a ground untilled, a heart unknown to bear such fruit, till by thy hands twas sown. Look as your looking glass by chance may fall, divide and break in many places small, and yet shows forth the selfsame face in all proportions, features, graces, just the same, and in the smallest piece 
as well the name of fairest one deserves as in the richest flame. So all my thoughts are pieces but of you, which put together makes a glass so true as I therein no other's face but yours can view. And I think that's the work of someone who could have been a great poet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. That's a really, uh, really lovely uh, uh, talk and uh, I finished on a, on a very lovely note. Um, I wonder whether I could have just ask you first about, well, first may I say to, the, to, to those who are watching, uh, if you've got a if you've got a question, I did ask this earlier, but I've muted myself unfortunately. If you've got a question, just press the Q and A button at the bottom and write it in, and then that's magically sent to me, and then I can I can ask it to uh, ask it to Claire in the usual in the usual way that we do these things. Okay, it, it's to do with your methodology, really, Claire. Um, there's there's long there's been a long debate about the veracity of using literature as historical evidence. Your methodology over a number of years appears similar to that of the new historicists of the 1990s in using history as a context for literary critical analysis and discovery. So I just, just, just very briefly, would you just like to elaborate on, on your methodology uh, and its importance in the way that you've 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 come to uh, to Drayton. Well, that's such a um, such a huge and, and interesting question. Um, I my approach is confined to a single period in English literature. wouldn't It wouldn't cover everything which new historicism does or any period. It covers a single period when we know for a fact that writers were st struggling against censorship. So it's, it's only useful if you know there was a very strong and powerful reason for writers not to be able to say openly what they mean, as in Russia today with Navalny. And you can well imagine now among the followers of Navalny and, and, and opponents of Putin, you can imagine them using all sorts of methods for transmitting um, what they really think to each other. Uh, muzzled writers, which is what all the contemporaries of Shakespeare as well, I think they were muzzled, uh, did everything they could to signal um, uh, to readers that, that they should work hard to understand them, that there were two levels, that there was something else. And in our case, 400 years later at this distance, I'm afraid that includes digging deep into the historical and political context, otherwise we can't. At the time, of course, they had all that. Uh, and you can imagine if you knew all the references, uh, the political references, and you, was, you were deeply politically invested uh, in an issue and you heard it on the stage or, or in a poem, you would be avid to pick it up. We're not, we're not even interested. Um, to get there, we have to become immersed in the history of the time. And, and that really is my approach. And I think with some lesser writers like Drayton, it makes them, you, you see where their skill lies and often their skill actually works against what could be genius. With Shakespeare, my feeling is it adds to his genius. Yes, there's a touch. I, I, I just wondered whether there was a touch anyway when you were talking about the move from Goodyear to, um, to Harrington, whether it was, to, it was to do with, you know, he who, uh, he who pays the piper uh, calls the tune, you know, that he'd moved from somebody who'd got Catholic sympathies. And as a writer, as a professional writer, he'd just got to move now because yes. he was now within a Puritan family. He had to, exactly. That's, that's it. He, he moved, and when he moved, uh, Goodyear made sure that he moved into a Catholic family. But she married into a Puritan family, and you could see him like a chameleon changing immediately because, well, he had to. The piper paid the tune and, 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 and he had to write a Puritan poem. But what's very interesting was this puzzling break. He was given an absolute plum patron and his, his biographers can't understand why he rejected her. He could have gone on writing Puritan poems for her, but he didn't. He broke with her very publicly um, and started to dedicate his poems to Catholics and to write poems, if anything, that were Catholic. 
a, a few questions have come in. So, uh, John, thank you for that, Claire. I think it's just very interesting. We might come back to that on, on equivocation as well. But, but let me come to come to some other questions first. John, uh, John Fordresher says, I'm hoping we'll talk a bit about the dramatic monologue as a characteristic genre of British Christian writing. We've heard in this series about uh, Southall's St. Peter's Complaint and about Elizabeth Barrett Browning's The Runaway Slave. Drayton's The Legend of Matilda Phil fits into this history and constitutes an important example of poems bearing witness to faith even in the face of martyrdom. Mm. Gosh, that's such a such a good question. It shouldn't be a question. It should be a statement. It's true uh, and 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 fascinating. Of course, a part of Drayton's camouflage was to surround uh, a Catholic monologue like uh, Matilda's, as time went on, with with neutral ones or simply plain historical monologues. So. The heroical epistles begin with Henry II to Rosamond and Rosamond to Henry II. Now, in that one, uh, uh, um, Drayton is definitely demonstrating uh, what's happened to the, the current um, Protestant church, the downfall of the Protestant church. Next one are the, are, are to Matilda letters. Um, and and so and after that there are some simple historical ones. So he sandwiches his monologues, his Catholic monologues, carefully among other monologues. But I, I would agree. I think they are um, they're developed from Southall. He shows a great um, he, he has a great debt for, for to Southall in his complaint writing. Um, these are searching internal monologues. And I think the condition of England in the 16th century is what created this psychological depth, which gave rise to Shakespeare, this literal soul searching, which um, Southall really pioneered. But Southall was very, very English in his mindset. And he picked up, he knew the English loved this kind of thing because the Mirror of Magistrates is an ongoing anthology of monologues from the past that carry a political or religious charge within them. They began by being, they were religious, but they were reformist and then became more Catholic as time went on under Elizabeth. So I agree that they are a space in which both Catholic and, and Protestant can reflect on and consider and air um, their predicament. Thank you for that. Um, Richard Vorgerman, who's uh, sent us uh, messages in the past. Hello, Richard. Thanks for a uh, question today as well. And he says, in terms of reflections of contemporary events in literature, I recently heard the theory that John Benson fiddled with the original order of the sonnets in 1640 in order to conceal their veiled commentary on events at court, especially as they involve Southampton. Uh, that's very interesting. I don't, I don't know about that. I, I um, had a look at the order of those 66 sonnets. Um, I suppose my interest in those sonnets is the ones that were missed out. Uh, he definitely, the most Catholic of all the sonnets and a very beautiful one was missed out because as you know, he wrote an early set, much shorter set of sonnets in the early 1590s. And he incorporated some of them in that later set. And I think he did miss out. I'm sure they became more political and reflected what's going on in the court and they could well then have been politically um, jiggled with. But what's interesting is that he missed out to me um, his, his early open, dangerously open um, Catholicism. And I'd, I'd like to just look at the beginning of Sonnet 22 in the early edition where it begins, my heart imprisoned in a hopeless isle, peopled with armies of pale, jealous spies. The shores beset with thousand secret spies must pass by air or else die in exile. Now, what's interesting is that, that I love pale, jealous eyes, don't you? But um, that that just doesn't apply later on. It, it isn't the Jacobean situation quite. Uh, and, and he omits that, and it's also dangerously open. So uh, 
a deep study of the order of the, the, the later set of sonnets would be a very interesting thing. And um, uh, I'd like to know more about that. Well, Mike Collins my, um, comes in with a good, uh, good question here. Hi, Mike. Um, if, if Catholics at large, and not just the coterie of the Catholic cognoscenti, could decipher the coded messages of consolation and encouragement, why did the censors not also recognize what was going on in the writing and then suppress it? Mm. Well, that's, that's, that's so often asked, and that is the key question. I've often thought about this because we know, for instance, that Bird was doing it as absolutely understood. Uh, and I think that there was far more toleration in a sense in, in, the, in censorship, provided that you, you kept to the rules uh, you didn't break the rules, you could get away with quite a lot. Uh, there is nothing rule, rule breaking in the harmony of the church. Although that volume does have a very interesting early publishing history. Uh, it, it looks as if it might've been suppressed and then reissued under another name. I'm not sure about that. No, I don't think anybody is, it's very murky. But um, yeah, there was a, a whole range, as I say, of Anthony Monday, the other example, of writers who, once you look at it, appear to be writing rather obvious Catholic code. Well, it makes one wonder um, if how in how much of a minority Catholics were. We know, for instance, a lot of the followers of the Earl of Essex were Catholics. We know the Earl of Worcester, who was in charge of entertainment at court, was Catholic. He was the man who chose Shakespeare's company uh, to be the king's men. Uh, wherever you look in the court, you see quite influential but quite inert Catholics. So they are passive, but they accept an awful lot of um, subterfuge and surreptitious writing. We know about people who, who got caught and were put in prison for getting it wrong. But if you're subtle enough, it's considered clever, witty, how seditious is it? Well, actually, I think Drayton's was a bit seditious at the beginning, uh, and I think it was a very clever way of getting it through. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it, it, it seems it seems to me that uh, this issue of equivocation and what happened with the Garnet tr the Garnet trial that uh, that equivocation you could actually take an oath, but as long as you thought in your head whilst you were taking it that you were not taking it, then you were all right. That was um, politically so dangerous that uh, they got to be executed. You, there was no no doubt that, and it was. I mean, the the, the trial is is horrendous anyway. But they got to be executed as far as the authorities were concerned. And maybe that there was at times when the authorities knew about something, but these people weren't as dangerous and therefore didn't act on it. Exactly. I think I think that's true, that uh, if you're doing it in a court of law, you are undermining the law. Of course, there was a dispute about how the law was being implemented, that it was illegal, uh, actually. And, and Sir Edward Coke had to alter the law in the light of the way the Ecclesiastical Court of High Commission was forcing clergymen <clears throat> to take an oath that they would tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth but uh, without any, um, what do you call it, Fifth Amendment, reservement, re reservation of silence. And that only came in as a result of the enforced oaths of the late 16th century, where people had to incriminate themselves or else take an yeah. oath which would yeah. lose them their livelihood if they didn't. Yeah, I agree. Yes, so, I, I, <laughs> ironic uh, that we, we come to the end of the discussion here today, unfortunately, at, at a moment when, Probably in Washington, they're just about starting the impeachment, um, and and they're arguing about about, about the oaths, <laughs> and has he has he gone against his oath of office? Uh, Claire, thank you uh, for such a, a wonderful talk and so stimulating as ever. A little controversial, also as ever, as some of the questions uh, demonstrate. But thank you, thank you so so much for that. Um, can I just announce that the next talk in the series is on the 23rd of February, when Professor Mark Bosco from Georgetown will be speaking about Flannery O'Connor. And I'll be joined on that day by my co-convener from Campion Hall, uh, Joe Simmons, who is actually 
in America at the moment, but is is with Campion Hall. COVID causes all kinds of all kinds of uh, issues. Other talks this term are Professor Noel Sugamara on John Milton on the 9th of March, and uh, Dr. Paul Edmondson on William Shakespeare on the 16th of March. Can I point out that on the 16th of February we have another Zoom event, uh, which is within the free speech uh, uh, area. And this is on women's voices in a weary world. Uh, it's at 11 a.m. EST, 4 p.m. GMT. And uh, we, we, we're teaming up again with the free, freedom, free speech uh, uh, unit in Georgetown and the Las Casas unit at uh, Blackfriars. And it's going to feature some wonderful uh, speakers. Professor Rosie Campbell, the director of King's College London's Center for Women's Leadership. Baroness May Mary Gowdy from the House of Lords in the UK. Dr. Paula Johnson, president of Wellesley College in Massachusetts. And from Paris, the international uh, journalist, Nina Sutton. And they're all going to be in discussions with uh, uh, Sanford uh, J. Ungar from Georgetown and uh, with me here in, here in Oxford. So thanks again to Claire and also to my co-convener, Joe uh, Simmons at Campion Hall. Uh, thanks for those of you who have uh, submitted questions. Uh, apologies that I got muted, that Claire got muted, but we got there. We, we got there in the end. I'd also like to thank those at Georgetown University who make these things happen, especially uh, the wonderful Yvonne Quek uh, and her colleagues who make, make uh, the Zoom all possible. Special thanks as ever to uh, Professor Catherine Temple at Georgetown University, who feeds the questions through to me. At Blackfriars, Dr. Richard Finn, Dr. John O'Connor, Kinga Rona Gabnai, thank you to, to you for helping us at the Blackfriars end. And at Georgetown, uh, we couldn't do this without the support of Dr. Jack Jajura, the president, and Dr. Tom Banchoff, the vice president of global affairs, and uh, Dr. Soyika Colbert, uh, the interim dean of Georgetown College. Um, and finally, my thanks to you, the audience, uh, uh, a good audience uh, once again. Please join us at 11 a.m. EST or 4 p.m. GMT on the 16th of February and 11 a.m. EST or 4 p.m. GMT on the 23rd of February. In the meantime, everybody, uh, take care, keep safe, have your vaccines when you can have them. Uh, I'm Mike Scott. Please follow me on Twitter at Mike Scott Prof. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Goodbye.